Space Cowboy Books presents Simultaneous Times, a science and speculative fiction podcast. Short stories to stir the imagination by contemporary authors. Welcome to the five-year anniversary episode of Simultaneous Times Podcast. To celebrate, we've teamed up with editor Eric Fomley to bring you stories from the pages of Shacklebound Books. This is the Genesis Ship Arkhaven by Jonathan Fick, with music by Fall Precautions, read by Jean-Paul Garnier. This is the Genesis ship, Arkhaven. A garbled transmission crackled over the speakers on the bridge. Identify yourself. Over. The fact that the massive ship only visible as a gleaming speck of high albedo mass from his bridge was identifying itself as the very ship that Captain Matthew Sully Sullivan commanded was disconcerting. The fact that it was on a collision course with his own a fact that the alarm klaxons blaring across the bridge would not stop alerting him to, raised the situation from frustrating prank to life or death problem. The Ark Haven was designed for two purposes. First, to build a Krasnikov bridge enabling superluminal transit to a habitable star. And second, to be the vanguard of humanity to the stars. It was a technological Noah's Ark containing enough life, human, animal, and vegetable to sustain a foothold on an extrasolar planet. Sully simply could not allow whatever it was that was masquerading with his call sign to snuff out the lives in his charge with its unrestrained burn trajectory. Your window for a missile launch is closing. Commander Deluxo's dark uniform was as crisp as it would be before any inspection. Unlike some attached to the Arkhaven mission who coped with the certainty of never returning to Earth with minute lapses in discipline, Deluxo never flagged with even the tiniest details. We need to launch, or we need to leave. Are we ready to leave? Is the cargo secure? The Krasnikov engine primed? Every last embryo, Deluxo said, his fingers drumming against a digital timer counting down the time until the calculations suggested a missile strike would merely create a cloud of debris that would destroy the Arkhaven in a rain of small impacts rather than a single catastrophic one. The engine is lacking its final test, but every simulation agrees that it's ready. Open a channel. Sully waited for the telltale click in his earpiece that denoted an open frequency. This is the Genesis ship, Arkhaven. Identify yourself. Over. Captain? Deluxo rose from his console, took his place by Sully's side. That's us. Though the shining speck grew larger with every second, Sully looked from the viewport to the screen where Deluxo was pointing at an optical scan. The ship on a hard burn for them was identical to the Arkhaven. Sweat beaded on Deluxo's brow and his lip trembled. Captain, the timer. We need to launch now. Sully lifted his fingers to tent them over his mouth. How could the ship on his scan be the ship on which he stood? He needed to protect the Arkhaven, and it took only one simple word and a missile to do so. All it would cost was... what exactly? Seven million human lives frozen and waiting to be incubated to take their place, ensuring the lifeboat of human civilization? Were those lives even still aboard the Phantom bearing down on them? How was any of this even possible? Captain, we need your orders. He couldn't do it. If there was even a chance that the Phantom Arkhaven was real, and contained the same cargo as was in the one beneath his feet, He could no more destroy it than he could allow it to destroy him. The timer on the screen ticked ever closer to zero, and the speck of light grew larger and larger as it loomed toward them. Prime the Krasnikov engine. But what if... 10 seconds. 
Engage it, Sully said. Five seconds. The order rippled across the bridge. A warning blared through the vessel and commanded all hands to prepare for an interstellar transit like nothing any human had ever attempted. The Arkhaven shuddered as fusion reactors shunted all available energy to the torus in the center of the craft that would tunnel through space-time and allow them to attain superluminal speed. It's finally happening, Deluxo breathed. What do you think we'll see as we slip the bonds of time? One second. The timer froze. The bulkheads flexed and whined under the strain of the Krasnikov engine, and the false Arkhaven receded. Sully exhaled. His fingers slipped from where he had clasped them together, sweaty, trembling. The strain of the near collision echoed through his body. He closed his eyes and let his body simply relax. The millions of lives entrusted to his care were safe. Seconds ticked by. Seconds that Soli knew were dilated into years outside the boundaries of the Krasnikov tube created by his ship. When he opened his eyes, he wondered how long it had been in real time since their narrow escape. What the hell is that? Deluxo asked. That's the destination star? It can't have intelligent life. We've spent decades studying it. Why would something appear now? Sully snapped his eyes to his XO, triggered as much by the gravity implied by the typically proper Deluxo's minor profanity as anything else. Interference from the exotic matter churning in the Krasnikov engine radiated in chaotic waves and made the ship's sensors dance and scream. But a single stable signature read out amid the noise, unmistakably artificial and directly in their path. And why is it so recognizably human? A pit formed in Sully's stomach as he opened a radio channel and spoke into the distortion of space-time that surrounded the ship. This is the Genesis ship, Arkhaven. Identify yourself. Over. He closed the channel and awaited the reply. Free Man by Warren Benedetta, with music by Fog Machine, read by Jean-Paul Garnier. The light from the Synthtech fab unit cast an eerie green glow on Victor's face as he peered through the glass at the synthetic woman being assembled before his eyes. The android silicone skin faded from milky white to medium brown as chromatic polymers adjusted to match the skin tone configured on the fab unit's touchscreen. Subdermal actuators adjusted the structure of the synthetic's face, raising its cheekbones, reshaping its eyes, slimming its jaw, while semi-fluid silicone fillers plumped the lips and rounded the chin. The legs and arms lengthened, the hips widened, A pair of small breasts swelled under the synthetic's bodysuit. Victor turned away from the fab unit, then paused. Sitting on a bench behind him was a well-dressed man with a matte black smart sleeve fastened around one forearm. A hollow stream of a news report projected from his smart sleeve into the air in front of him, showing a drone's eye view of yesterday's jailbreak at Rancor Island Prison. The fleeing prisoners looked like scattering insects as they fanned out from a breach in the prison wall. The man noticed Victor looking at him. He dismissed the hollow stream, then plucked a small earbud from his ear. Yes? He seemed annoyed by the interruption. Oh, sorry, Victor said. I was just wondering about this one. He indicated the synthetic in the fab unit behind him. Is she a replica or an original? The man looked around with faux-confused expression. 
do I look like I work here? No, I thought, she's not yours? Nope, mine's over there. He gestured at a smaller fab unit down the line. Inside, a preteen boy was being fabricated. The synthetic bore a passing resemblance to the man. Same curly auburn hair, same deep-set blue eyes, same thin lips. For the wife, the man clarified. Ah, my bad. Victor wandered down the line of fab units to take a closer look at the boy. Cute kid, have a name yet? He did. The man sniffed, then looked down at his hands. Tommy. Victor winced a little. He should have known the boy was a replica. Why else would someone choose to fabricate a child, if not to replace one they had lost? Sorry. It's okay. It was a few years ago. The man stood and walked over to the fab unit. He smiled sadly as he gazed at the boy's face. He would have been ten this week. You aging him up? Yeah. Can't keep him young forever, right? He tapped and swiped on his smart sleeve, bringing up a 3D hollow scan of the same boy, the real Tommy, albeit a few years younger. What do you think? He looked at the older version of the boy in the fab unit. Pretty good likeness, right? Definitely, Victor agreed. It was more than just pretty good. It was perfect. Synth tech technology had gotten scarily accurate in the last few years. The company was able to synthesize a perfect replica of any person, living or dead. It was illegal to do the former, though. There were strict laws against creating a synthetic version of anybody who was still alive. The days of identity theft being just a stolen credit card or social security number were long gone. Criminals could now steal a person's actual identity with something as simple as a 3D hollow scan of their likeness. Except for a small micro dot array at the base of its neck, a synthetic was indistinguishable from an actual human. The man dismissed the hollow stream of his son, then looked down the line of fab units. There were about 50 of them set up along the perimeter of the Synthtech store, all of them busy fabricating new synthetics. Which one's yours? the man asked Victor. None of them yet. Still trying to decide. So many choices, you know. The lie came effortlessly. I can help with that, a voice said from behind. Victor turned to see a Synthtech store associate approaching him. The associate wore a black collared shirt with a glowing green Synthtech logo on the chest. He extended his hand to Victor. I'm Chris, and you are? Just looking, Victor said. He held up his palm to ward off the impending sales speech. Thanks, though. As Victor lowered his arm, he noticed that the 12-digit number tattooed on the underside of his wrist was visible. He quickly tugged his sleeve to cover it. Don't thank me yet, Chris replied with a sly grin. This week only, we're running a special promotion. Try out any of our synthetics for 24 hours, free of charge. If you're not completely satisfied, we'll refund your deposit, no questions asked. He clasped his hands in front of his waist, then leaned forward and lowered his voice. Now you can thank me. Before Victor could reply, the fab unit containing Tommy's replica gave a cheery little jingle. The glass door slid open with a whoosh, releasing a rush of super cold air into the store. Steam swirled and spiraled around the synthetic as he stepped from the fab unit and smiled up at his human father. Hey dad, where's mom? A sob hitched in the man's chest. He hugged the boy, then took his hand. Come on, let's go find her. He smiled at Victor as he walked past. Nice meeting you. His eyes darted to the cuff of Victor's sleeve. Good luck. You too. Victor self-consciously tugged his sleeve down as he watched the man lead the synthetic out of the store and over to a woman waiting at a table outside. 
The woman's hands flew to her mouth when she saw the boy. She grabbed him in a tight embrace. Tears spilled from her eyes. After the woman released her grip on the boy, her husband leaned in to say something. The woman's brow furrowed with concern. She glanced into the store, directly at Victor, then quickly averted her eyes. She said something back to her husband. He nodded in agreement, then swiped at his smart sleeve as they began walking away. So? Chris prompted. What do you say? Victor nodded. Let's do it. Victor sat across from Chris at the sales counter in the back of the Syntex store, his knee bouncing impatiently. The ordering process was taking a lot longer than he had anticipated. He shot a glance over his shoulder. He didn't like having his back to the entrance. He hated not being able to see who was approaching from behind. He sighed, then turned back to Chris. We almost done? Chris pivoted the point-of-sale touchscreen around to face Victor. Yes, sir. I just need you to review this, then sign at the bottom. As Victor scrolled quickly through the contract, Chris leaned in and commented in a lowered voice. I'm glad you finally decided to pull the trigger, by the way. Victor looked up from the tablet, perplexed. Excuse me? I saw you in here yesterday, talking to my associate. Chris motioned to another Syntex store rep further down the sales counter, a heavyset man with a patchy red beard. The nameplate on the counter said his name was Simon. We work on commission, so... Ah, well, you earned it. Victor scribbled an indecipherable signature on the touchscreen with his finger, then pivoted the screen back to Chris. Very good, sir. Chris tapped on the touchscreen a few times. And will this be an original or a replica? Victor's fingers flipped the coin drive containing the 3D holoscan over in his hand. His palm was slick with sweat. Replica, he answered, then placed the small silver disc on the counter. Excellent. Chris clicked the coin drive into the reader on his tablet. A holoscan of Victor's body appeared on the screen. Chris frowned. Sir, uh, I apologize, but we can't accept this scan. Sure you can. Victor palmed a plastic cred from his pocket and slid it across Chris's desk. The denomination on the front was 100,000 cc. More than a sales rep like Chris made in a month. Chris's eyes darted around, then focused back on Victor. He whispered, I can't take this. Sure you can, Victor said again, more pointedly this time. Or should I talk to your friend Simon over there? I'm sure he'd be happy to help. He motioned to the heavyset sales associate. The gesture seemed to catch the man's attention. He glanced over at Victor. A mixture of recognition and concern rippled across his face. Shit, Victor thought. He hadn't intended for the man to notice him. Simon apologized to his current client, then stood and walked over to Victor. Hello again. Was there a problem with your replica that I can help you with? Victor swallowed hard, then smiled. Nope, everything's fine. Chris looked between Victor and Simon, confused. I don't understand. Did you order... A commotion arose behind Victor, cutting off Chris mid-sentence. His eyes shifted past Victor to the front of the store. The color drained from his face. Victor turned to see a dozen black-clad police in full tactical gear storming through the glass doors behind him. The cops fanned out in a semicircular formation as they approached the sales desk, their weapons at the ready. Simon raised his hands and backed away. I'm sorry, I, I didn't spend any of it, I swear. Relax. Victor said as he stood and faced the police. They're not here for you. A cacophony of shouting voices ordered Victor to put his hands in the air. Victor complied. One of the cops clamped a cuff around one of Victor's wrist, then bent his arm roughly down and behind his back. 
As he grabbed the other arm, he checked the 12-digit number tattooed on Victor's wrist. It's him, he shouted. He bent Victor's other wrist down and cuffed it, then leaned in and growled into Victor's ear. Wait till we get you back, boy. We're going to have a good time. He gave Victor a shove, then grabbed him roughly by the arm and walked him out of the store. Outside, another cop opened the back doors of an armored van parked on the sidewalk. White block letters were stamped on the side. Rancor Island. The two officers lifted Victor into the transport. Neither of them seemed to notice the small micro dot array at the base of his neck. The doors slammed shut, leaving Victor alone in the back of the van. He closed his eyes and rested his head against the cool metal interior, cursing himself for starting that conversation with Tommy's father. He hadn't meant to. Seeing the hollow stream about the prison break had frozen him in his tracks. The conversation was just a cover. But then the guy saw the number on Victor's wrist, which made the situation even worse. He must have connected the dots and called the police. How else would they have known Victor was here? Victor regretted not getting to the Synthex store earlier. It took him too long to come up with the plan. Too long to realize that all Synthex needed to fabricate a replica was a hollow scan of the original. Even if the original was a replica itself. He realized that he could create another replica to take his place just as the original Victor had created him yesterday. But he had been too casual about it, too worried about looking like just another customer instead of ordering the replica, the replica of a replica, the moment he walked into the store. As the transport pulled away from the curb, Victor peered out the narrow window at a crowd of onlookers that had gathered to watch his arrest. His synthetic heart trip-hammered in his chest. One of the men in the crowd looked familiar. No, not just familiar. Identical. The man gave Victor a nod and mouthed one word. Sorry. Then he turned and disappeared into the crowd. A free man. In this episode of Simultaneous Times, you heard This is the Genesis Ship Arkhaven by Jonathan Fick, with music by Fall Precautions, and A Free Man by Warren Benedetto, with music by Fog Machine, from the pages of Shacklebound Books. We would like to thank the authors and Shacklebound Books editor Eric Fonley for making this episode possible. Shacklebound Books produces wonderful speculative fiction anthologies. Find out more at shacklebondbooks.wordpress.com. We would also like to thank all of the authors, voice actors, and composers that have made Simultaneous Times possible. And a special shout out to Fog Machine, Red Blue Black Silver, Patrick Hearn, and Paul Precautions for all of their wonderful music over the years. Theme music by Dane Lescombe. <laughs>